Thank you, Tim. And good morning and welcome, everybody. Um, this is my, I think, my second or even third time here in the last couple of months. I've had the wonderful, wonderful opportunity of four months off work. Um, so um, I, w I won't go too uh, much into who I am. Um, the only reason this logo is here today is because I loved the rainbow logo. That's it. Um, I'm not representing IEM as such. I'm here to give a, a perspective on the market into which all organizations in this room attempt to either one, sell, or two, work with, or, or three, participate with in some capacity. Um, as Tim said, I've been around in the industry a while. I might well be iconic and legendary, but they're not words I would choose for myself. Uh, but thank you to whoever ever uh, did say that. Um, I've got, I don't know, 15, 20 years of experience leading technology functions, building them in retail, out of retail, consulting to them, delivering to them, lots of stuff. DHL was a big client back in my consulting days. I um, worked within Sainsbury's, um, part of the team that acquired some of the bits that are now coming together in front of us. Um, Work within John Lewis was uh, also at the partnership level crafting some of the group structures that they've now uh, announced and are implementing. Uh, latterly, House of Fraser, uh, where they, um, they kindly um, gave me, alongside being a CIO, supply chain to run. And, and that was an amazing experience. And it took me all the way back to my student days where I used to throw parcels into the back of a great universal stores lorry all night on a long weekend when I was a student in Salford um, and earned 900 quid, which set me up for most of the term. Um, so I've, I've been steeped in distribution, logistics, retail. I'm part of the ecosystem. I'm, I put myself as a retailer before anything else. Um, and I've been doing some stuff with technology of late. I've encountered most of the companies uh, here. My job is to just, I, I th this is what I've defined my job as today, um, give you the context uh, within which the conversation that will proceed from here on uh, is set. This is, this is an industry right now in existential crisis. The UK retail industry has been preeminent for 200 years. I've been very um, Lucky to work as part of the Sampower group of companies that has an interest in Hamleys. There's an organization that's got 250 odd years of history. We've been selling stuff as a nation of shopkeepers for millennia, really. Um, we are a trading nation. Um, and we've done that uh, within global context, regional, national, but retail really stands out as an industry. Um, within which about 20% of the population of a working age have a direct or secondary relationship. So um, we are one of the biggest employers. We're therefore statistically relevant. And unfortunately, there's a lot of bad stuff <laughs> occurring right now that is defining the focus and priority uh, of the boards and taking the attention of the people in those, in those, those organizations away from the second big thing that's happening, which is a huge pivot of power um, between consumers and retailers. Um, it's been happening for a while now, but the shift of power is occurring and is now accelerating. So there are a couple of big pivots that are, uh, are really, really challenging the retail industry. And you've seen it, look, since Christmas, 700 shops have shut, another 1,400 shop closures have been announced. We've seen five or six major retail brands go, uh, and we're seeing a huge amount of negative press uh, in the industry. We saw Dixon's Carphone announce a data breach yesterday, six million customers' accounts compromised. Um, there are a huge series of headwinds facing into the industry that we all serve and are participating in alongside this huge pivot in power towards consumer. Um, and locals, who you'll, you'll get to hear from later, talk of the I economy, that which is focused solely on me. Uh, and and that, that shift in power is being driven by this increasing expectation. But let me um, just pose that question, because you're all selling into this industry. 
in one shape or form. You're all serving this industry in one shape or form. And, and I just wanted to step down some of the left-hand side quickly because there are some obvious things here that are driving the market into a different shape and, and place. Store closures driven largely by rising property costs, not necessarily rentals, but rates. There's a big business rates review that's flowing through the industry that's putting some retailers' costs up by 50%, depending on where they are, but some not. And so there's some huge imbalances being driven into the industry. Some of that inequity isn't being effectively shared back into the ecosystem that is retail. And, and you'll see some of the reactions. You know, Lord Wolfson coming out and saying, uh, uh, hang on, if you let these people do CVAs, you're levelling the playing field in favour of the failures. That's not fair. You know, why should I maintain high rentals and high cost of property when over there they just get to package up the bad bits of their business and come back to life leaner and meaner? How can that be fair? So there's a lot of inequity in the ecosystem that is retail right now that's being driven by a load of this stuff. But performance, ultimately profitability, is hugely compromised. And you'll see most declaring softness, if not failure to meet expectations on their profit line. There are a few exceptions, but that number is diminishing, not increasing. Um, over on the right, that's why. <laughs> Actually, there's less money in the market. We're all tightening our belts. We're all keeping things a little longer. We're all spreading our spend, particularly in grocery, between many retailers. We're shopping for less more often. We're taking a more, a, a more active interest in the perishability of our produce. So we don't go and buy a big load of vegetables at the weekend, because we know they go off. We go to the convenience store, or we go to Aldi and Waitrose. And so the, there's a big shift being driven into our industry by a spending decline. At the same time, as we're facing all of these headwinds, that combination of factors is leading simply to this. A set of competitive closures, we're seeing them fall apart. People cannot tolerate that and that simultaneously for very long unless you've got vast investment backers or a load of money in a bank. And given this, this industry makes single-digit gross margins on most stuff, they don't have a load of money in the bank. They, this is a trading system, and if there's no volume coming in and there's no investment coming in, it falls apart quite quickly, and that's what we're seeing. People are closing and consolidating. The Sainsbury's Asda merger is a reaction to the Tesco Booker merger, which in itself is a reaction to the Amazon and um, whatever their food business is. And these, these things are, are driving each other now in a very unhealthy set of dynamics. Being, if, when you're forced into a merger situation, you have to make good of it, but you have to make good of it quickly. And so, some of the things that I'm concerned for in the boardrooms of retailers, this is the kind of stuff that's distracting their attention. Swallowing Argos and then merging with Asda is going to keep Mike Coop, his entire boardroom, and most of his leadership team occupied for some time to come. And the effect of that is that they don't then focus on getting better. They just focus on getting bigger. And bigger is not better, always. Um, and you'll see space. Space keeps coming back into this picture. We've got too much of it. We've got too much of it. The dynamic has shifted. Spending patterns have changed. We don't need big, but we do need everywhere. And so being everywhere without big means that we're putting ourselves into a different dynamic. And exactly the conversation for today, how do we connect with customers when we don't have big and we don't have everywhere, because we can't be everywhere yet as an industry. Um, and the shift in channel mix, and by the way, a word that I would never use to describe how a customer feels about a retailer. We, we know as consumers, we don't talk about channel. It's not something, did it, if, I, if I said, uh, Louise, where did you buy that lovely jacket? 
shop. A vintage shop. Yeah. And, and what's, what's the name of the shop? Buffalo. Buffalo. Yeah. yeah. So you never said in any thought or, or conversation there, I bought that from the Buffalo website, did you? Or I bought that from the Buffalo mobile app. No. You bought it from Buffalo. Yeah. Your relationships with the brand. And so having that association with a brand, irrespective of channel, for us in this industry, it's all about how we create connectivity across our operations to ensure that channel is never a word that confuses our customers. Yet we organize around channel. We've got the web merchandising team, or we've got the X, Y, and Z channel-centric team. Organizations in retail are not keeping pace with a shift in consumer power base and nor is our distribution and logistics operation. And, and I'll just quickly talk to some of the reasons why retailers are struggling in the, in the here and now. And it's for some really simple things. On the left, this is a, a set of things that I would hold out in my board coaching role. Can you tell me, dear CFO and CIO, your version of the brand values of the organization you serve? Often the answer is no. They have a different sense of understanding, meaning. They project that into all of their teams. And all of a sudden, you've got a big business that doesn't really know what it stands for. And it starts there. Because they don't actually know who they sell to or who buys from them in the main. Customer data, and we know we talk about it as a risk today rather than an opportunity. And look at that emphasis. Actually, it's the biggest opportunity that retailers have creating absolute alignment across all of their functions around a single understanding of who the customer is. Yet I've sat in the boardrooms of many retailers where you ask that simple question of every member, you get a completely different answer. If you get a completely different answer on who, what we stand for and who we serve, you can be assured you get a different answer on what we sell, how we sell it and through how we measure ourselves, and how we optimize our resources to direct the business that we're in in engaging customers. Actually, if you, if you, if you forced a retail CEO to admit, most big retailers are product-centric out businesses. They're not customer-centric in businesses. Their attempt to create connections with customers through an operating model that inherently takes the supply side efficiencies and attempts to add margin and send it to customers. On the right then, there are a set of factors where I think most retailers have started to pay more attention because of this set of misalignments. I do an awful lot just trying to help people get these things lined up, simply lined up. There are systems, of course, that can help, but it's often just about people and relationships. On the side, however, on the other side, absolutely this is where technology and data can bring about some of the aligning forces to this left-hand side of challenges. Supply chain operations, for me, is, a, is as simple as it sounds. It's how do we connect supplier to buyer with the fewest possible moving parts? And if they have to move, how do we create simultaneous flow of physical product data and money between parties in an ecosystem that is moving constantly, day on day on day. How does that operational process occur across organizational boundaries, not just within, but outside? And look, in the room, we've got participants in this network. Retail is a network, uh, and it's there to support consumer need, ultimately. And that's where the power base lies. How do I string together all of the relationships in a meaningful, coherent, communicative, brand-aligned way to our customers, when even within a retailer, they struggle to be aligned on brand? But how do you, as distribution and logistics partners to the retailers, express their brand when they don't know how to? So it's a challenge. <laughs> anyway, all the way down here, I think there's a list of stuff where retailers are starting to focus their attention. And they realize it for one reason. This whole dynamic shift from the high street through the out of town, 
from the big to the smaller and to the mobile shop. Who grew up once upon a time where you would go and buy a single fag from a guy that drove a van onto your estate? Hand up. I can say you did. You did. You never snowed. No. But you know, that once upon a time, I used to grow, you know, ride my BMX around an estate in Wigan where a guy would drive onto the estate, open up his van, sell you what you wanted. We're back where we were once, a, once upon a time. Actually, have you seen some of the innovation? We call it innovation. Shops on trolleys that you can wheel into an office and somebody can come with their mobile phone, open the door, take something out, close it, be charged. That's the same, isn't it? That's just a shop, just a mobile shop run by a guy that replenishes it, comes onto your estate, sells you a single fag. Anyway, that shift has happened. It's a one-way street, by the way. It's a one-way street for one simple reason. The big retailers bought a load of space that they now don't need. It's all being released for residential development. You'll see it all over this area of the country. Big land banks suddenly and quietly being exited stage left because they can't afford to maintain an investment in a property portfolio when they no longer need to build on it. So that shifting dynamic is creating an opportunity for more of us people to believe that we can demand an industry to support our absolutely focused point on us. And it has to be convenient. Because actually, if you think about it, home delivery is an anathema. Most of us aren't at home most of the time because we're all out grinding through our day jobs to earn enough money to pay for the expensive jeans that our teenage children want. It doesn't kind of work right now. There's no equity in this market. And we're facing a period of time where the market will start to reposition. It will start to re-level and that equity will be redistributed. But right now there are two constituencies gaining huge benefit from that inequity. And we're one of them, customers. We're getting it all while the retailers are trying to work out through their ecosystem how to redistribute value. And this was a reaction. Ah, if you're not at home, why don't you come into the shop? You can just come to the shop anyway. Um, <laughs> now you can... <laughs> new idea. Yeah, brand new idea. Let's ask customers to come to shops. But it works. It does work, actually. It works because they hang around and they spend more. And there is an uplift. And there is a cross-sell opportunity. And much more importantly, there is a brand association opportunity. Because our brands as retailers are losing their volume in favor of the brands of the products that we sell. And there's another big shift. And I think there are, if there are three big shifts that I'd talk to, it's, it's that. The power base shifting from, from retailer to customer. The economic factors against us that are prevailing with the strongest headwinds I've ever felt. And the third is the, sh is the rise of the brand and the, the sub summation of that within a retailer. Look at House of Fraser. The House of Fraser brand is really diminished relative to the brands that it sells. And actually we, and particularly our, the younger generation, my children in particular, um, have an association with the brands they buy, not the retailers they buy them from. So collect, you know, click and collect services are a great opportunity to continue to reinforce your brand positioning um, which is diminished in the internet. It's really, really noisy out there on Google. And search terms are escalating in price um, because we're all trying to make our voices heard. But it's creating some real difficult economics in the UK industry at large. We're seeing massive amounts of space being thrown up in the Midlands. We've seen labor pulled out through Brexit. The Amazon recruiting van used to park outside there in September. I was with Terry Murphy, who runs that, last week. The Amazon recruiting van was there last week, in June. That's because Amazon's rocked up and built 1.3 million square feet of space in Milton Keynes. He's running 3 million now. This is an awful lot of fresh air rocking around in the system to serve people who are not at home, 
there at work who still actually want to come to shops. Supermarkets still enjoy about 94% of their business through stores on average. People still want to come to shops, yet we've created this enormous extra cost in our industry to serve a potentially falsehood about shopping habits. And we put a load of traffic on the road. And guess what? A load of fresh air here, and there's a load of fresh air there. Hands up anybody that runs fully, fully loaded lorries. None of you. No, there's always space, isn't there? This is not an efficient model. A lot of fresh air here, a lot of fresh air there. Actually, I think some of these gig economy offers are creating the problem, not solving it. They're solving it for the immediate demands of, of customers, but they're actually creating a falsehood in the way in which this entire part of our ecosystem is inefficient. It's creating costs that we didn't have before. It's creating impact that we didn't have before. And as a retail ecosystem and market at large, I think we need to think hard about that. And we as customers never think about that. What is the cost implications of this stuff to us? It's going somewhere. It's going somewhere. If I want my five pound item that costs 11 pounds to deliver, somebody's picking up that loss. And it isn't just an economic loss, it's potentially an environmental loss too. But there's tech, and tech can help. And a whole bunch of these things have applicability. And I'm sure you're going to hear from organizations today that exploit some of these technologies to help that inequity in the system come back into some level of equilibrium in this economy that's being driven by consumers with a self-centered position that basically looks like this. I want it all. I want you to make all the efforts to come and find me. And I don't just mean in terms of delivery. I want you to come and find me as a customer. I want you to spend all of your marketing dollar attracting my attention. And then I will choose to do business with you or not. Then I want you to come and find me in space and in time. Because I want it all. I want you to do all the work. And then I want you to bear all the costs. And it's with that backdrop that I'll leave you to talk to others in the room that can help you and the retail industry at large solve for this big existential problem. All right.